Hello. Welcome to the national webinar about Arts Here. I am Dr. Joy Young, Vice President of Programs at South Arts, a regional arts organization. My skin is medium brown. I have black hair and I'm wearing a yellow shirt. My glasses are blue. I am so happy to introduce the program Arts Here to you. Arts Here has the honor of being the nation's newest program serving our country. And South Arts has the honor of being the national administrator of Arts Here, as well as working in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts, also known as the NEA, and working with the other five regional arts organizations, New England Foundation for the Arts, Mid-Atlantic Arts, Arts Midwest, Mid-America Arts Alliance, and the Western States Arts Federation to develop and implement arts here across the U.S., its jurisdictions and territories, and the District of Columbia. The technology being used for today's webinar allows you to post your questions, which will be answered either verbally during the question and answer period at the close of the webinar, or by written response throughout this presentation. To ask a question or review the questions posed by others watching the webinar, please use the Q&A button on the Zoom interface which is located alongside your other Zoom controls, likely on the bottom of your screen. As you can see, today's presentation features an American Sign Language interpreter who will be visible throughout the duration of our webinar. We are also providing closed captions in English, Spanish, and other languages. To enable captions, please select the captions setting in your Zoom controls, which are likely on the bottom of your screen. To access captions in, language, in languages other than English, you must be using a Windows or Apple computer with Zoom meeting client version 5.11.2 or higher. Language translation services are not available on mobile devices such as Android, iPhone, tablets, or Chromebooks. Now, to officially kick off our conversation about arts here, I would like to introduce the chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson. Dr. Jackson was appointed to the National Council on the Arts by President Barack Obama in 2012, where she served until becoming the NEA's 13th chair in January 2022. With this historic appointment, Dr. Jackson is the first African-American and Mexican-American woman to serve as chair of the NEA. For more than 25 years, her work has focused on understanding and evaluating arts, culture, and design as critical elements of healthy communities. Chair Jackson will discuss the NEA's commitment to ensuring everyone in this nation has opportunities to live an artful life and how arts here will make strides towards this goal of advancing inclusion and access to the arts. Welcome, Chair Jackson. Thank you, Joy, and hello, everyone. I'm a woman with dark hair, it's pulled back. I'm wearing a black turtleneck and silver hoop earrings. I'm delighted to join you today and to see so much interest in arts here, our new grant program. The concept of arts here was first shared in the NEA's Equity Action Plan released in 2022. In that plan, we affirmed our commitment to increasing our impact and building arts participation among historically underserved groups. While many underserved groups have rich histories and cultures, 
We know from research that underserved communities frequently report lower rates of arts participation than others. Arts Here was created to address these disparities. This program will help support and help strengthen nonprofit organizations that have demonstrated consistent work to ensure that all people throughout our nation can live artful lives. As chair of the NEA, I've been advancing the concept of artful lives. It's an idea that encompasses a wide range of experiences from the creation and presentation of art by trained artists and public engagement with this art to the ways that the arts can or should show up as part of our daily lives through making, doing, teaching, learning. I believe the ability for all people to live artful lives is a key element of, an, of equity, of justice, and of a healthy existence. Arts Here will provide both grant support and grantee learning opportunities. And through this initiative, the NEA will be intentional about better understanding how grantees approach their work and what they need to succeed. This can inform how the NEA and how other funders can be most supportive in the future. Arts Here recognizes that the arts have intrinsic value and are also connected to all dimensions of our lives, our communities, towns, and cities. The arts are essential to our health, education, community and economic development, the natural and built environment, and more. Through this work, we're helping to build strong, diverse arts and culture ecosystems that are crucial to building healthy communities where all people can thrive. We're excited to collaborate with South Arts and the other regional arts organizations on this initiative. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about arts here. Back to you, Joy. Thank you, Chair Jackson. During today's webinar, I will cover Arts Here goals, the three major components of the program, the two-part application process with a focus on part one, which is currently open to eligible applicants. I will also be joined by a few colleagues from the NEA and our partner regional arts organizations to provide more information on the program's learning and evaluation components, along with a review of the GoSmart online grant portal. Given the volume of attendees, more than 3,000 registrants, we will do our absolute best to answer as many of your questions today as we can. However, if we do not get to answer your question today, we will share the contact person within your region who can gladly assist you further. Additionally, posted questions will be turned into a question and answer document, which will be posted on the Arts Here webpage by December 8th, 2023. That webpage is www.artshere.org. Arts Here reflects goals and objectives identified in the NEA's 2022 through 2026 strategic plan. Key elements of the goals and objectives include supporting opportunities for all people to participate in the arts and arts education integrating the arts with strategies that promote the well-being and resilience of people and communities, building capacity and infrastructure within the arts sector through knowledge sharing, tools, resources, and evidence-based practices. The intent of arts here is to strengthen the capacity of organizations that are already engaging with underserved communities or groups to boost arts participation, learn from their experiences in undertaking this work, and connect these organizations to each other and to other relevant entities. This will happen through technical assistance and peer learning opportunities intended to bolster, amplify, and extend effective strategies and ways of working. 
In the long run, investments made through the Arts Year program will build Brantee's capacity to sustain meaningful community engagement and increase arts participation for underserved groups or communities. Arts Year core components. Arts Year grantees will benefit from investments, learning, and evaluation. Investments in the form of non-matching capacity building project-based grants will range from $65,000 to $130,000 each. It is anticipated that there will be approximately 95 grantees nationally. Unlike many grant programs, Arts Here grants do not require a cost share or match from the grantee. Special thanks to the Wallace Foundation for providing matching funds to the regional arts organizations in support of Arts Here. As mentioned earlier, Arts Here offers grantees additional resources and assistance beyond grant funds. Leaders and staff of Arts Here grantee organizations will participate in learning communities for knowledge sharing, network building, technical assistance, and many other offerings offered by grantees themselves. Our colleague with the Mid-America Arts Alliance will share more about these organizational services in just a bit. As a pilot program, Arts Here will be documented and evaluated by the NEA to better understand the capacity building project activities supported through this program and how grantees approach the work. Also, what is learned through Arts Here will be shared with grantees for their own understanding, learning, and growth. The evaluation will result in a summary of lessons learned and may inform the future of the Arts Year program. Our NEA colleague will share more regarding the evaluation component later in today's presentation. The next few slides will cover information regarding how to apply for part one of the application process. Information about part two will be made available to those applicants invited to submit a full application. Before I talk about more, talk more about part one, I'll share the three kinds of entities eligible to apply to arts here. Mm -hmm. Broadly speaking, the following are eligible to apply. Nonprofit tax exempt 501c3 U.S. organizations, federally recognized tribal communities or tribes, or non federally recognized tribal communities or tribes that are also nonprofit tax exempt 501c3 U.S. organizations. 501c4s and 501c6s are among organizations that are ineligible to apply. Please review the guidelines for additional information about eligibility. Part one, the statement of interest. Part one of the process requires the submission of a statement of interest which consists of a series of questions requiring brief and concise responses. Regional arts organizational staff will review the responses to determine if an application is eligible and complete. Then, independent screeners will determine if the application aligns with the goals and objectives of the Arts Year program. All applicants who submit a part one statement of interest will receive a status update in March, 2024. A select number of applicants will be invited to part two of the process, which is the submission of a full application. Part two of the app arts here application process is by invitation only. 
Artistic excellence and artistic merit are the primary criteria which will be considered by screeners and panelists during parts one and two of the review process. For the purposes of arts here, artistic excellence and artistic merit can be understood as the organization's use of the arts in any discipline is a core component of consistently engaging its community or serving and or reaching individuals whose opportunities to experience the arts are limited by race, ethnicity, economics, geography, or disability. Artistic excellence and artistic merit are evidenced through these primary review criteria, organizational capacity and capacity building project, alignment with the arts here commitment to equity, engagement with historically underserved communities. A secondary review criteria will be used to ensure that a diverse group of organizations are selected and funded through arts here. The criteria includes geographic location, artistic disciplines, cultural traditions, operational scale, arts or cultural programming, organizational budget sizes. For the purposes of application review, underserved group community refers to those whose opportunities to experience the arts have been limited by factors such as race, ethnicity, economics, geography, or disability. This concludes our overview of the application process. I now welcome Karis Adams, Professional Development Specialist for the Mid-America Arts Alliance to share more about the learning component for arts here. Karis. Hello, everyone. My name is Karis Adams, pronouns she, her, and hers. My skin is brown. I am bald with black, black and gold eyeglasses and gold earrings. My shirt is primarily white with black gestural marks. I work with Mid-America Arts Alliance as a professional development specialist, and I am one of the co-chairs for the technical assistance portion of the Arts Here program. Technical assistance is often described as organizational services, capacity building, or professional development. We like to think that technical assistance encapsulates all of these things. In addition to the funding received from the Arts Here program, grantees will receive 18 months of technical assistance and participate in peer learning opportunities with other arts here grantees. This includes professional development through one and a half to two hour long cohort meetings, one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, and additional topic specific workshops. Topics are largely determined by grantees based on conversations with coaches, as well as grantee input through questionnaire and survey answers. Participating organizations are expected to consistently attend monthly cohort meetings, one-on-one -on -one coach meetings, and topic-based expert workshops for the first 12 months of the program and optional for the remaining six months. Other staff and board members are welcome to attend, especially if the content being covered is their specialty or responsibility. Workshop topics can include, but are not limited to, fundraising, budgeting, marketing and communications, planning, board development, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and community engagement strategies. Capacity building activities with coaches include development or revision of operational policies and systems, budgeting and grant management, strategies for monitoring, evaluating and learning, financial structures, restructuring of organizational and procedural ways of delivering programs and services, and organizational advancement. And lastly, to ensure that we are providing organizational services that meet your needs, this program will be evaluated. Participants will complete surveys on the services received. I now welcome Dr. Patricia Moore Schaefer, NEA Deputy Director for the Office of Research and Analysis to share more about the evaluation process for arts here. Patricia. Thank you so much, Karis, and hello all. 
My name is Patricia Moore Schaefer, pronouns she and hers. I'm a middle-aged woman with shoulder length straight blonde hair and black and pink eyeglasses. I am wearing a collared blue shirt. I am one of the co-chairs of Evaluation Services for Arts here. The National Endowment for the Arts will lead an evaluation of arts here to better understand the project activities supported through this program and particularly how grantees approached their work. The NEA will contract an independent research firm to, to conduct the evaluation during the grant program's period of performance. The evaluation will collect information from grantees about their organization's experiences during the program so that we, the funders, may better respond to your needs and improve program. The evaluation will also foster learning about grant making strategies, as well as organizational practices that support arts participation and engagement in historically underserved communities. Findings from the evaluation will be made available to grantees, as well as funders and the general public. Summary results of the evaluation will be shared through reports, presentations, and other materials, but in a way to protect the identity of participants. No identifiable information will be released without a participant's explicit permission. All grantees are expected to complete as part of the evaluation and also of their grant annual progress reports that must be submitted at the end of the first year, as well as a final descriptive report within 30 days of the end of the grant period of performance. Grantees will also be asked to complete feedback forms on the initiative and may be asked to share program related materials such as flyers or publications. Selected grantees will be asked to participate in optional evaluation activities. These may include case studies that highlight and share organizational practices. Case studies may involve interviews with your staff and information about your organization. So asked to serve on a technical working group and contribute feedback, insights, and other information on a regular basis during the period of performance to inform implementation of arts here. Participants will be compensated for participation in optional evaluation activities. Compensation will be based on guidance provided by the Office of Management and Budget and is expected to range between $50 and $75 per hour. To talk about informed consent. This is the process of disclosing important information about a research study to, par to potential participants and also asking for their consent to participate. For the evaluation of arts here, there will be a two-step informed consent process. The first step is a notice. The second step will be an informed consent form that will require your uh, completing it as well as signing it. Both the notice and the form summarize key information about the evaluation so that your organization fully understands the activities and expectations for participation. Of note, grantees will complete an informed consent form upon acceptance of a grant award. The form will confirm whether your organization does or doesn't volunteer to be part of the optional evaluation activities. The form also provides detailed information about required and optional evaluation activities for grantees, as well as other information, including how we will be protecting the privacy of your data. Grantees may choose to start or stop participation in optional activities at any time. To do so, grantees will need to contact the Office of Research and Analysis at the NEA. Contact information will be shared on the next slide. So again, please feel free to contact me at this email. I am happy to answer any question your organization might have about the evaluation of arts here. I now welcome Jessica Gronick, West Staff's GoSmart and CV Suite Program Manager to share more information about the GoSmart online grant portal. Jessica. Thanks so much, Patricia. As Patricia said, my name is Jessica Gronick and I'm the program manager for GoSmart, a technology product of the Western States Arts Federation, RAO. 
GoSmart is also the application portal will be used uh, that will be used for arts here and where you'll find the statement of interest and any additional applicable forms for submission. I use she, her pronouns. My skin is fair. I have long brownish red hair and I'm wearing swirly silver snake earrings and a dark green sweater. So before submitting your statement of interest in the GoSmart system, you'll first want to visit artshere.org to fully read through the guidelines and any additional information. You'll learn more about or be reminded of everything you're hearing about today, including expectations, timeline, resources, RAOs, and contact information. Once you feel confident in understanding the program, head to usregionalarts.gosmart.org or click any of the applicable buttons at artsier.org that read something like submit your statement of interest or apply now to be taken to the GoSmart portal. At the GoSmart portal, you'll want to review the contents on the homepage and in the additional resources pages. When you're ready to register, click the Create New Account button in the top right corner. Note that if you have registered at any other GoSmart.org site in the past, such as westfgrants.gosmart.org or southarts.gosmart.org, you must register anew at this usregionalarts.gosmart.org site. You must also use a unique username that is different from any username you've used at other gosmart.org sites, but all other registration information can be the same. On the registration form, be sure to read through and agree to the terms of use at the top of the page by checking the box beneath the terms. Select organization as your account type. Individuals are not eligible to apply. Be sure that the primary grant contact is named in the profile. If you're filling out the registration page for someone else at your organization who should be responsible for receiving communications regarding the grant, enter their name and email address. The address should be that of your organization as well. Select the response that feels the closest to accurate for organization type and discipline. Responses will not affect your application score. Include your organization's unique entity identifier or UEI if available but note that you will not need to provide your UEI until or unless you are selected for grant funding. If you'd like, visit sam.gov to learn more about getting a UEI so that you can prepare to secure one if applicable. After completing the registration form, click save at the bottom of the page and note that you are now logged in. Hold on to your username and password and be sure to use the same credentials every time you return to usregionalarts.gosmart.org. If you forget them, you can use the forget username or forget password tools at the login page of usregionalarts.gosmart.org. After registering or logging in, click on the grant application and forms tab along the navigation bar towards the top of your screen. Scroll the page to locate your regional arts organization, also known as your RAO. Your RAO either houses the state where your organization files a 990 tax form or where your federally or state recognized tribe primarily conducts its programming. You'll see the logo for each RAO across six possible uh, cycles on the page. Along with the logo, you'll see a small map indicating the included states and territories for each RAO. And finally, a list of the included states and territories for each RAO. Note that RAOs are listed alphabetically. So even though everyone will see Arts Midwest as the first option on the page, any organization not in the Arts Midwest region should continue to scroll down the page until they find their appropriate region. Once you find your organization's regional arts organization, click the teal start button to begin. If you're returning to work on an in-progress statement of interest from this page, locate your regional arts organization again. Now click the yellow edit button. Do not click a new teal start button for a different REO and you'll only click a new start button if you began your statement of interest in the wrong region. After clicking start or edit, you'll be in the read write form of the statement of interest. You'll see a table of contents with six pages on the left-hand side and text and questions on the right-hand side. Use the small caret in the table of contents to hide that section if desired or keep it visible and use that as one way to navigate through the pages of the statement of interest. Respond to all required questions as indicated by a small italicized note reading required above the question. Click Save Work to save your responses and keep working on the same page, or click Save and Next to save and continue to the following page. Click Previous to move to a previous page if desired. 
After clicking Save Work or Save in Next on any page where you enter data, you can always leave and return to work on your statement of interest as many times as you like until you fully and finally submit before the deadline. At any point while you're working on your statement of interest, you can review a formal read-only version by clicking the View PDF link at the bottom of any page. This read-only version is what is provided to your grant admin and the panel reviewers, so be sure that you are content with your responses prior to submitting. To submit your statement, navigate to the submission page and click the Save and Submit button before 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time on January 19, 2024. If you do not see a Save and Submit button, but rather you see error messages on the submission page, you're missing one or more required questions and you'll not be able to submit until those questions are answered. If you're missing required questions, but you would like to complete your statement of interest, return to the page or pages with the incomplete questions, complete the question, click Save Work or Save in Next until all missing required questions are complete, and then return to the submission page to ultimately click, sorry, to ultimately click Save and Submit. You must fully submit your statement of interest in order for it to be considered, and complete statements that are not fully submitted and in the received status will not be considered. Statements cannot be modified after they're submitted, so continue to work on your in-progress statement until you're content with your responses. Do not submit more than one statement of interest and do not submit a statement of interest in the incorrect region. After successfully submitting, you'll see a one-time confirmation message and receive a confirmation email. Avoid emails going to spam by adding no reply at gosmart.org to your address book and use an email address in your registration form that is amenable to bulk emails sent from servers. If you do not see this confirmation message or receive the confirmation email, return to your grant applications and forms page, locate your regional arts organization statement of interest that you begun, and verify your status in the gray header. If it does not display as received, you likely have not fully submitted your statement. If you're unsure what your status means, reach out to the program manager for your regional arts organization. For technical issues regarding the use of GoSmart application portal, please email artshere at gosmart.org. You can also locate additional tutorials and guides under the additional resources section of the GoSmart portal. For eligibility, narrative, or programmatic questions, please locate the contact information for your program director of your region at the Contact Us section of artshere.org, also listed in the additional resources pages of the GoSmart portal. At this time, I'd like to share a bit more about the regional arts organizations and the arts here point of contact for each one. The United States Regional Arts Organizations, also known as USREOs, are a collective of six nonprofit art service organizations. The RAOs serve the nation's artists, arts and culture organizations and creative communities with programs that reflect and celebrate the diversity of the field in which they work. The RAOs partner with the National Endowment for the Arts, state arts agencies, individuals, and other public and private funders to develop and deliver programs, services, and products that advance arts and creativity. In fiscal year 2023, they invested over $18.4 million across the United States and jurisdictions through nearly 2,400 grants that reached more than 1,000 communities. Let's do a quick introduction to the Arts Here Point person at each REO. Arts Midwest is led by President and CEO Tori Allen. Holly Dahl is the Program Manager and Contact for Arts Here. Holly's office hours are Mondays and Wednesdays. Mid-Atlantic Arts is led by Executive Director Juan Suki. Leanne Wallet is the Program Director of Creativity and Community and is the contact for Arts Here. Leanne's office hours are Mondays and Thursdays. Mid-America Arts Alliance is led by President and CEO Todd Stein. Christine Bile is the Director of Arts and Humanities and is the contact for Arts Here. Christine's office hours are Tuesdays and Fridays. New England Foundation for the Arts is led by Executive Director Harold Stewart. Audrey Serafin is Program Manager of Regional Grants and Initiatives and is the contact for Arts Here. Audrey's office hours are on Thursdays. South Arts is led by President and CEO Susie Serkimer. Ayana Strawn is the Director of Arts Partnerships and the contact for Arts Here. Ayana's office hours are Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. 
Then finally, Western States Arts Federation is led by Executive Director Christian Gaines. Sierra Scott is the grant specialist and contact for arts here. Sierra's office hours are Mondays and Wednesdays. And now with that, we'll begin our Q&A session and I'll hand it off to Sierra Scott to moderate, joined by Joy Young. Hello, uh, thank you, Jessica. I am Sierra Scott, Grant Specialist with West Staff, and I will be helping moderate the Q&A section. Uh, as a reminder, you can place your questions into the Q&A box, and we will try to address as many of your questions as possible in our limited time today. If we do not get to your questions, you can also reach out to your REO contact during uh, their office hours to address any of your more specific follow-up questions. Uh, we've had a fair number of questions in the, in the Q&A as well about uh, whether this webinar and the slide deck will be available after the presentation, and it will be. It will be posted on the Arts Here website. In addition, there will be an FAQ document created from the questions you all have asked today, and that will be placed on the website no later than December 8th. Okay, uh, so looking at some of the questions that we've gotten um, a fair number of upvotes on, I'm going to start um, by asking Joy, uh, is this grant intended for the creation of new programs or the expansion of current programs, um, or can it support existing programming? Our arts here is designed to support organizations and work that has an ongoing um, time frame, so nothing new. We want to be able to support the work that has, um, has happened over time. Um, we want to support organizations that have uh, significant engagement with historically underserved communities. Great, thank you. This is a follow-up question um, in the same line of that, um, that a number of folks, folks have asked in different ways. They're asking if you can clarify whether it's a capacity building grant or a grant to support programmatic costs. And if you could give some examples of the types of programs and projects um, that this grant is intended to support. Very specifically, these grants are to support capacity building activities. Um, it is not project support grant. This is not project support funding, nor is it to be considered um, um, what we would call operational support. Capacity building projects um, are those kinds of projects that will enable an organization to do more of the work it is currently doing, to um, sustain its ability to continue the work it is doing, or to expand the work it is doing into um, additional underserved communities. So an example might be, and this is purely an example, um, I don't want these examples to become the projects uh, that, that uh, are, are submitted. Um, an example might be an organization that works with people with disabilities. A capacity building project might be strategic planning to determine are there other communities of individuals with disabilities that they could serve. Um, if they are serving people with autism, might they want to expand into other um, uh, communities of people with disabilities? And that strategic planning process would help them understand the feasibility of expanding the work. Great, thank you. Um, piggybacking off of that, as far as underserved communities, uh, folks are asking, how do you define an underserved community? And I know this is in the guidelines as well, uh, how the National Endowment for the Arts defines this. Uh, folks are specifically asking about um, the LGBTQIA plus community or veterans. Um, again, underserved for purposes of this program are specifically defined as, and if my folks in the chat um, who are putting information out there would be so kind as to drop that very specific language in the chat, that would be helpful. Um, but it is very much centered in race, ethnicity, geography, people whose access to the arts are limited by race, ethnicity, um, geography, and I am missing something, and disability, if I'm not um, mistaken. 
um, to identify individuals as LGBTQIA would certainly also need to fit within the, the definition of um, underserved. So LGBTQIA alongside disability, alongside access limited due to geography, alongside access limited to race, ethnicity. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, will equal consideration be given to small or arts organizations as to large institutions? Indeed, um, as stated earlier, those secondary review criteria are incredibly important to ensure um, organizational organizations of all sizes are considered and included as arts here grantees. Thank you. This one is also in the guidelines, um, but we've received many questions about it. So I just wanted to have it clarified verbally. Um, can our organization receive funding from the NEA directly and still apply for arts here funding? Yes. Thank you. Uh, next question, is it appropriate to apply if arts is an aspect of the organization, but it is not solely an arts organization? For instance, we provide youth programming of all kinds but would apply for a grant specific to an arts program. Yes, arts here is designed for those organizations that do provide art services directly, but also those that are part of the arts ecosystem. So based on the description I've just heard, um, that arts programming would be um, uh, eligible uh, the organization would be eligible to apply um, using the example of the arts programming. Thank you. Uh, do agencies uh, or organizations have to implement the project for the entire period of performance from October 2024 to June 2026, or could they uh, implement the project in a shorter time period? It could happen within a shorter time period. And to be clear, we we're talking about the whatever that capacity building project would be. And while the project in and of itself might be completed um, earlier than the full project period, there is still the expectation that the organization would actively participate in the other activities. Um, that the program provides, very specifically the organizational services component and the evaluation components. Thank you. Uh, this is about the independent screeners. Um, how are the independent screeners selected and who are they? So the independent screeners, uh, as well as panelists, are those who have um, um, deep and direct experience in arts and cultural programming. Um, we also have what are called lay people, individuals that represent um, the communities who have experience in the arts but aren't necessarily employed by the arts. Um, those individuals, their names are not named, and yeah, you can imagine uh, why it is important not to name an individual. I, I personally wouldn't want to get the phone call asking me to um, um, uh, provide favor for an organization. So those individuals are not named. Um, however, these individuals are, in fact, um, um, those who are working in the arts, and or those who have um, key knowledge and, and awareness in the arts but are not employed. At the conclusion of the um, program, um, those names may be um, um, provided. However, currently we do not have um, the names of the individuals who will be reviewing grants um, across each region. Thank you. This one is also in the guidelines, but a fair amount of folks have asked it. Can organizations apply using a fiscal sponsor? No, fiscal sponsorship is not allowed. Thank you. Uh, how many organizations do you anticipate applying and how many or what percentage do you anticipate making it to stage two? 
Well, that's a great question. And so I'm not, uh, not the best at math where it comes to percentages. Um, so if, if we look at um, current numbers, each region having approximately um, 500 to 700 applicants. Um, and of that number of times, six of our regions, uh, knowing that we anticipate awarding uh, at least 95 grants, someone out there can do that math very quickly to arrive at a percentage. So my apologies for not um, providing that, but if someone wants to jump on a calculator or someone who's much faster than I at math um, could provide the numbers percentage-wise, that'd be excellent. Great, thank you. Can programming occur in multiple places to enhance reaching underserved communities or do you require the events to happen at one main location? I'm sorry, repeat the question. Can programming occur in multiple places across a region uh, or does it have to happen in one location? That's a great question. Remember, these applications are for capacity building uh, um, activities, not project activities. So while it is possible that an organization may have um, activities, arts activities across various locations within um, their community, ultimately the grant itself is for a capacity building project that serves the organization. It is not about the various kinds of programs the organization is administering. Thank you. Uh, we've had a fair number of questions about the grant request. Um, uh, typically in the realm of our organizations uh, encouraged to apply with the lowest ask in relation to their budget, so 65,000, or they encouraged to apply all the way up to the 130,000 and how um, could and should that be decided for organizations? An organization really is going to have to um, decide and, and make the ultimate decision about what amount um, is necessary for them to deliver a um, capacity building project that will result in their ability to um, serve underserved communities. I dare not uh, uh, say what that means because a small organization may in fact want and need a larger budget to implement a, a capacity building project that moves the organization in the direction it wants to go. Um, we've provided the range for just that, um, for just that uh, possibility. Um, so that organizations can be thoughtful and really considerate about needs and align a budget with those needs. Thank you. All right, we've got time for just a couple more. Uh, uh, sorry. Must our facility and programming be fully ADA compliant to be eligible for grant funds? That is a great question. Um, each grantee will be expected to, um, that's the best way to say it, um, will be expected to demonstrate how it does and meet um, uh, ADA compliance and requirements and or if it's grandfathered um, in uh, such that the building is too old, if you will, to have ramps and such. Um, but yes, there is an expectation that an organization um, receiving funds does do its due diligence around providing uh, accessibility to people with disabilities. Thank you. Uh, this next question is regarding eligible funds. Um, a couple of similar questions about if the organization wants to build capacity by hiring uh, an executive director, would this salary can be considered eligible capacity building funding? And the, can the grants pay a percentage of salaries of existing staff who are working on the capacity building or would they only be to fund uh, consultants, for example? 
the, the, there are a few areas in that um, question, Sierra. So let's break that down. The first part of that question was around, say that again. Uh, around if the funding could be used to hire, um, uh, say, a full-time executive director or move an executive director from part-time to full-time. I think it's really just about if this funding can be used to support salaries. So again, this is not an operational support grant, but a project support grant. As a project, specifically a capacity building project support grant, um, you would need to, the applicant would need to justify and show within the budget that obviously staff are going to be needed to help administer this capacity building project. So um, um, those kinds of expenses are allowable expenses. Um, hiring an executive director would be more of an operational expense and as such would not be an allowable expense in and of itself. It's going to be incredibly important that the budget and the budget narrative also align with the capacity building project narrative. Um, the narrative uh, for both the capacity building project and the budget should align such that it is clear how funds are being expended and how those funds ultimately help the organization, again, um, serve underserved communities. And, and Sierra, I wanna go back to that question around ADA compliance. Um, actually, uh, from a capacity building standpoint, an organization utilizing or wanting to be able to um, become more ADA compliant could in fact be a capacity building project in and of itself. Well, that was my next question. So you've already answered it. Thank you. Uh, I think um, that unless there are any other questions that I'm seeing specifically about GoSmart, which I'm not seeing at the moment, I think that we are here at the end of our Q&A section. Uh, bear with me just a moment. Uh, thank you all for your active participation today. There were a lot more questions in the, in the Q&A that we did not get to, especially some really specific questions about organizations. And for those, I really encourage you to sign up for office hours with your REO contact uh, to discuss all of those follow-up questions. Uh, you can also email your REO contact at their Arts Here email address, which is also provided on the Arts Here website. And again, as a reminder, the FAQ document uh, and this webinar will also be posted on that Arts Here website. So I will now turn things over to Joy to close our time today. Thank you, Sierra. Many thanks for your time and participation today. I want to express sincerest gratitude to the regional arts organization directors, their staff, and the Wallace Foundation for their role in Arts Here. A special appreciation to today's panelists and Chair Jackson for providing us with an enriching and insightful information into the Arts Here program and how you can engage. We have enjoyed this conversation and appreciate audience engagement with us. As Sierra stated, please reach out to us, your regional arts organizational um, contact person with any follow-up questions or feedback. We want to hear from you. This concludes our webinar today. We look forward to our continued engagement together. We want all to have artful lives. Thank you and have a great day.